American playwright Terence McNally may be at the height of a very prolific career. His plays are being staged all over the country. Last year, his Love, Valor, Compassion won the Tony Award for Best Play. This year, McNally is again nominated for a Tony for Master Class. His tribute to Diva Maria Callas stars Zoe Caldwell, and it is a hit, and Caldwell is great. For over three decades, McNally's plays have addressed serious issues with humor and affection, and I am very pleased to have him here. Welcome back, sir. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, so what shall we talk about then? I mean, there, let's talk about Ragtime first. Ragtime? Right. Oh, God. E.L. Doctorow wrote a novel. Mm -hmm. McNally, playwright, bringing it to the theater. Right. Uh, a musical. A musical. And it's going to be terrific, well, I think. Is that, <laughs> I hope that's not cursing the project. But we just, I just came back from Canada. We did a six-week workshop with the actors, fully staged, choreographed. Mm. And I'm only one of the authors. Lynn Ahrens wrote the lyrics and Stephen Flaherty wrote the music. And they've written the most glorious score. I feel so positive about a project. And I'm usually a nervous wreck before I begin something. Very uncertain. Is this going to work? Will this interest anybody? We're working from a great novel, so that's yeah. part of it. And it's this endless well to draw from. Uh, that book, whenever we got stuck or something doesn't work, we go back to the novel and we make it work. And uh, we're going to open it in December in uh, Canada, and it'll be on Broadway December 97. Now, so why did you off. do this? Our producer is Canadian. Uh, it's what he did with Showboat. Yeah. It's a big theater town up there, Toronto. Yeah. It's a big surprise to, to yeah. all of us. There's a beautifully restored theaters, brand new theaters, off off Broadway, off Broadway. So it's a it's a good community to do the play in, and it's going to be pr yeah, a lot but of whose Americans. Whose idea in. was it? The idea was uh, Live End, the producer yeah. uh, Garth Drabinsky okay. oh, and Marty Bell. Oh, yeah, right, They're the big theater guy. But it's like Spider Woman. You know, I'm asked to do a lot of musicals, and people say you haven't done very many. It's because most things I don't think would make good musicals. When Hal Prince and Fred Ebb and John Cantor said Spider Woman, I said great. When Garth and uh, Marty Bell said ragtime i said wonderful i didn't have a clue how i was going to do it but it seemed material that would sing that would be enhanced by music not diminished so we went to work we found lynn and stephen who are wonderful who, who's team. Lynn and the composer lyrics yeah. and aaron's right. and flaherty they right. did my favorite year at lincoln center and then they had to show up for the tony award about four years ago uh once on this island what else are you working on now well, I've got a one-act play that's going to open tomorrow night uh, at the Manhattan Theater Club, which is still my home theater. That's uh, They're going to do my new play next season. I've got a new play for, for Manhattan Theater a one Club. one-act play? Tonight, yes. is, tomorrow night is a one-act play yes. on a bill called By the Sea, By the Sea, By the Beautiful Sea, which I've written with Lanford Wilson and yes. Joe Pintoro. Oh, right. Next right. year is my new full-length play. And what is that? I'm very secretive before I finish. We don't talk about this, I don't do even we? give the title. People will say, why won't you tell me the title? And I, Lynn, uh, Lynn uh, Meadow knows, the producer. And that's it will, about it. I don't know. I think it's bad luck to give away. When it's finished. What's the idea? I, I don't we'll want talk to talk about that no, either. No, I think it's, it dissipates. All right, then what's the plot? <laughs> <laughs> Is it a comedy? Uh, uh, no. It's no, a it's musical. Not, it, no. It's, it's a, a drama. It's a play. I think the word... It's a drama. Play. See, yeah. I, my, my model of theater has always been Shakespeare. Yeah. They're all mixed well, up. Right, there's I agree, comedy. I agree. There's, so you know. one play does not yeah. have to be one or the other. No, one play can no. be part and, drama, part comedy. And people always say there's all these transitions in this play. I know there's transitions. One minute I'm laughing and 36... 30 seconds later, I'm depressed, or I sprain my ankle, or I turn on the TV, and something awful has happened. And I think theater should reflect... All right. All right. I'm, just, I'm not trying to play games I with know. you, but one more time. Is, is, where did the idea come from? Can you tell me that? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know where it came from. I can tell you where the idea of Masterclass came from. Well, I, I know where that came from. No, you don't, I bet. No, I was teaching at Juilliard, and I was very frustrated teaching how hard it was. John Guerra and I were teaching a playwriting camp class, and yes. I thought, this is so hard to get over what I mean without yes. saying, do it exactly the way I did it. And I was on the elevator, and, and uh, I heard two students saying, oh, Leontine Price is giving a master class. And I flashed my faculty card just about two years ago this time of year, and I went in and went to the master class. And I thought, How theatrical the situation of master class is. You pretend we're alone, just you and me talking, yes. then yes. suddenly you turn out to the audience and say, now see, Charlie yes. did that very right. well. Right. Right. I said, this is very theatrical. Then, about three months later, Manhattan Theatre Club did a tribute to me. Yeah. Uh, first, it made me feel very old. And Nathan Lane came out and did a speech from Lisbon Traviata, which is a play right. about people who admire Maria Callas. Right. Zoe Caldwell came out and did a scene from 
uh, a perfect Ganesha play of mine she had done. Right. And I went, master class. The first line of the play is no applause. The last line is that's that. And I started writing on the program, and people were saying, stop that. You've got to pay attention. They're doing scenes from your plays up there. Yeah. But I just had so this flash. So while you were actually doing that, you had the whole inspiration. See, I thought, uh, you're right, I didn't no. know. Because no. I thought it was because you either attended Muriel Callis's master class. I went to a couple of them, yeah, but yeah. I had no idea I'd write a play about them. So I went was... as a Collis groupie in those days. But you no. are now. You became oh, one. Oh, oh, I was always a Collis groupie, oh, but sorry. I mean, I didn't think I would ever write a... I just went to hear, be in her presence one more time, because I doubted she'd ever sing in public again at that point, because uh, she'd sung at the... Ma I go way back with her. I grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas, very near the Mexican border, and we could pick up on our radio the opera from Mexico via Monterey, Mexico, and I heard this woman singing Rigoletto, and I was about 14, and the sound of her voice did something to me. And her name, in Spanish, the announcers called her Maria Menihini Callas. Maria Menihini Callas. Yes, because that's the, their pronunciation. Uh, my father used to play Piaf records. I didn't know what she was singing about. The same thing happened with Piaf. The voice. Piaf. I heard feeling in that voice. So suddenly I started buying Maria Meneghini. I learned Collis records when I was still in high school and fell madly in love with the sound of her voice. She wasn't a, a, a celebrity the way she is now then. She was a good singer. She was fat. She, was, she didn't have uh, this scandalous life. I came to New York as a college student, stood in line for three days, to see her make her debut as Norma, and uh, she lived up to every expectation. By then, she had transformed herself into this rather Audrey Hepburn, yeah. very slender woman. But the greatness was in the musicianship. All the greatness of Collis is on her records. When people say, I wish I'd seen her, I say, you, you didn't miss anything. You miss seeing a very beautiful, compelling stage presence, but the genius is, is in those records because part, I bought in high school. Yeah, because part of the myth about her is that she was a better actress. Yeah, than she that's, was singer. That's a myth. And people think act, good acting is running around the stage frantically and tearing your hair. Just the other night, they had a show on, uh, on uh, NET called Divas. That's they right. showed Collis. Right. She was like this and sang Visitarte. She didn't move. She sort of once did her hand like that, and she held on to herself and barely moved. Most other singers run wildly around the stage singing Visitarte and look up to heaven and scream and shriek and throw themselves on the floor. She was a minimalist. It was all in the voice and with the music. All right, but let's talk about that adaptation yeah. then, because I've had people come on this program, at least one, I remember... Yeah. Uh, a director, uh, I've forgotten who it was now, but some the film director from Italy. Uh, and, oh, Zeffirelli. And, yeah, Zeffirelli. Yeah. Not thrilled with the callus he saw mm -hmm. in Masterclass right. with the play. So he's not right. thrilled with the callus you created. Right. Says it's not the callus he, he knew. knew. Uh, of course he's You don't not. disagree with that? No, everyone has. This you is took my liberties in order oh. to create. Again, it's, it's very much like adapting ragtime. I think I honored the spirit, the memory, the art, yeah. Everything about Maria Collins, but it's my interpretation. Just as I try to do the same thing with Doctro, someone else may say, I would have done a totally different adaptation of, of Ragtime. I would have portrayed this whole other side of Collis. This is a Collis I remember also from her master classes. I found her a, uh, a cruel teacher, not supportive, uh, frustrated. Not uh, reinforcing of. I mean, she once, I heard her say to a, a young uh, Asian soprano who was going to sing the role of Mimi the next night in the Juilliard Opera Theater, because the director of the production wanted to kill Collis after this incident, the woman sang the aria, si mi chiamo no mimi, quite beautifully, and Collis said, very lovely, dear. She said, but you make such awful faces when you sing, and you're such a pretty person when you're just relaxed like this. Can you stop making those faces when you sing? Yeah. She destroyed that soprano. That is, not yeah. a, that is not supportive. Sometimes I don't feel very supportive when I teach playwriting, because I get frustrated, or I get... A million things. Well, do things. you think so, people that are very... So to say Collis is bitchy in my play, I observed her being bitchy or what's... She, uh, I don't think Collis thought many of her students were up to her standard. And I think it showed. Uh, sometimes I've worked with students I don't feel are going to be very good playwrights. I feel I'm wasting my time, that they should maybe do something else. I think Coll it's very hard to be a committed teacher and commit yourself to students when you don't feel they're giving you back as much as you're giving them. And I've been in that position many times as a teacher. And I think a lot of people care about teaching, and I do care about it, take it so seriously. I'm exhausted after I teach, and I get very angry when I feel a student is not giving me 102% back, and I try to give them 102%. Well, part of the conventional wisdom about teaching is that the best 
performers. A great diva, very good playwright, Nobel laureate writer, are not very good in teaching what they know. A, because of patience. B, because they don't understand. And this is especially true with mm -hmm. athletics, you know, that great athletes can't teach, mm -hmm. whether it's golf or football or baseball, hitting a baseball, because they don't have patience, or B, because they don't understand, because it came so much easier to them than it does to the right. student. And there is a genius for teaching, too, and a and passion right. for and, it. You know. And I think at that stage in her life, Collis was probably not a very happy woman. Her active singing career was over, and she was not yet 50 years old. She was 48 years old when she taught at Juilliard. Joan Sutherland, Birgit Nielsen, her contemporaries sang into their mid-60s. It must be very frustrating to have lost your voice, which she virtually had at that age. Because she was be reckless? Oh, I, I think you have to be a voice teacher. Uh, I, that, technically, I don't understand the voice. I think there was a recklessness. My favorite Collis uh, comment about that was Beverly Sills supposedly once said, I'd rather have sung 10 years, uh, 10 years singing like Collis than 40 years as anybody else. I think Sills was also a very passionate singer who gave of her very different instrument than Collis, but people who gave her their... S Joan Sutherland does not give you her guts when she sings, and you could say that's why she still, you know, made her farewell at Covent Garden at 68, or she was almost 70, and Collis paid that price, but... I didn't write a play about Joan Sutherland. I wrote a play about Maria Collis. Yeah. And Edith Piaf is another one who, you know, sang from down, down there. And that's what, I think that's what great art is about. Art is about the soul and the heart, not about the mind. That's the editorial page. That's the dry play that talks about issues. I, and I'm not that sort of writer. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't identify with Joan Sutherland as a singer. I respect her, but I don't, I don't buy her records. And, I, and I'm not denigrating her, uh, uh, but Collis, she, she made me feel alive as a kid. I mean, I was growing up in a hick town in Texas. There was Corpus a lot of... Corpus Christi's not a hick town. Uh, yes, it is. If you're me, it's a hick town. I had my bags packed early, but, <laughs> you know, she, she made me more alive, less lonely. I, I, let me say one other thing. I also had a great English teacher in high school who this play is as dedicated to her as it is to anyone, if you know what I mean. She... She gave me that passion at an early age that art is important. It adds meaning to our lives. She made it fun to read a play by William Shakespeare when I was 14 years old. Most kids are terrified of Shakespeare, and so they remain terrified as adults because they were traumatized by a bad teacher. Bad teachers are what are ruining this country, I think. I'm passionate. I think teachers should be paid half a million dollars a year, the good one, minimum entry yeah. salary. When you just think about the number of people, the young Terrence McNally's out there, yeah. who somebody can come along, who you're lucky because there was someone there who touched, gave you some sense, opened your mind, B, gave you some sense of self-esteem, three, gave you a love affair with a language, mm -hmm. you know, with a culture, how with an you, art. Can you thank someone and you like that? you just say, I want more of it, I Probably. want more of it, I want more of it, and it turns you on. Yeah. I always wanted to dedicate a play to this woman, and I waited till Frankie and Johnny, because it was the first play of mine that was successful enough, I thought might make it to Texas and play at a theater yeah. she might be able to see. And uh, uh, it, it's amazing what these people give us. And Collis was a kind of a teacher, too. Someone to inspire. So was Zoe. The first, I was very young, the first time I went to Europe, I was about 18, and Zoe was having her first great season at Stratford. And I just sat there and I said, this is greatness. And I saw Olivier that season, a lot of other more famous actors. The one I came back with, I was telling my friends, there's this woman called Zoe. I didn't know she pronounced her name, Zoe. Still Zoe Caldwell, she's the greatest thing. And then she came to America and was Anne Bancroft's understudy. And a friend of mine, Jimmy Coco, the late, wonderful Who Jimmy Coco, love, yeah. would call me and say, Annie's out tonight. Her back went out, and I'd go buy a ticket. They'd say, but Miss Bancroft isn't appearing. I'd say, I know, I want to see the understudy. <laughs> she was sensational in that play, sensational. She's a great, great actress. And I, you know, I said to Zoe, you've got to do these plays because it's important for a younger generation to see your standard of excellence in the theater. They've got yeah. to know what greatness well, is. Well, she gives it all. She told acting. me when she was here. First of oh, all, she, she came here. She, she sat here. She wanted to sit here for whatever reason. It had been angles, whatever. She's so seductive. Oh, yeah. And she so <laughs> just rolls this seductiveness and this mm. sort of wrapping you into, right. you know, what she, who she is. What she, not who she is, 
but her passion for what she does. She is passionate about it, and really? I'm so glad another generation is getting to see this because they will aspire to TV acting yeah. if they don't see great stage acting. If I don't see plays by Shakespeare, I'm going to aspire to movie writing. You know what I mean? Well, it's what do important. you aspire to with the Tonys you have and oh, with this and that? Uh, to write a play that just... Mm, I haven't begun to write the, the plays. I, I, I'm very hopeful about the new one. You know, that it's going to really... That it touches be, themes that you Yeah, think. it's going to be, yeah, yeah. That's why I don't want to talk about it. But mm -hmm. I've been so lucky to work with people like Zoe and Lenny Folia and, and Joe Mantello, these young directors. You know, for a guy well into his middle years, I'm meeting some really good young directors, and I've been very, very lucky. And, uh, and you know, we're very... You know, Zoe, unfortunately, is not going to stay in this play forever, and we have Patti Lupone when coming she in. She, uh, July 2nd okay. will be Patti's first night, and I'm another great lady, young yeah. woman of the right. theater. And people haven't seen uh, Patty act. They think of her as musicals. I remember as an actress at Juilliard, so I'm thrilled uh, about her coming in. So I've been lucky. You don't do it alone as a playwright. You know, you stand up there sometimes and you get an honor. And if you're a playwright, a novelist can be up there alone. Maybe his wife or his editor should be with him. A playwright should be there with 500 other people who helped him get up there. A couple of things I want to cover with you. Yeah. Have you healed this breach with Nathan? Yes. Yes. You, you picked. You picked up the phone. Who told you that? Uh, he did. Oh, he did. Yeah. yeah. You picked On up the, the air, he told you this. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, right. Well, you yes. You picked up he, the phone. Tell me what happened. What happened? It's just one of those awful misunderstandings. Uh, it's um, the movie of Love Valor is going to be made in about two weeks. Uh, Jason Alexander is going to do the part Nathan was scheduled for, and. Uh, it was, a, it was a big disappointment when Nathan told us he'd taken another job. Because he started and, the play. Yeah, and uh, we all... And, and, and it meant the, fi the people, the film producers, were not willing to go ahead and invest the millions of dollars without a comparable name in it. And it was very hard in three weeks to get someone to replace Nathan. Why so, couldn't you have waited? I never understood. Well, because now we'd have to wait until the summer of 97 because Nathan's... Before him? Yeah, he's contracted for a full year now. So we, we've, we've made up, but it was, it was a rough period for both of us, uh, yeah. you know. Imagine you don't was, like to, uh, what, disappoint friends and... Uh, it must have been painful for both of you just to... Yeah, not, I'm sure it was painful. I mean, this is a guy who you two have had a... Oh, he's such an extraordinarily well, successful he's, he's collaboration. Like, yeah, and he's... Uh, I mean, I think Nathan, I saw him just last night in Forum, and I thought it's a, a brilliant performance. I mean, there's no one like Nathan as a comic actor who can turn on a dime, which he doesn't do in form. It's not that kind of show, but the transitions he made in Lisbon Traviata or uh, Love, Valor, Compassion or Lips Together, Teeth Apart, I don't know any other actor who can have you. That's why he represents, my, understands my work so well, because Nathan does have you rolling on the aisles one, one second and then crying the next. And uh, he's a, I think he's a brilliant, brilliant actor. Did you anyway. like him in Birdcage? You know, I haven't seen it. Because we were, we were, on the outs, it was easier not to have an opinion about it. So I guess after, uh, you know, uh, I guess I can see it now. Uh, You've seen Rent? It, Rent, yes, yeah. Uh, you like it? Yes. Uh, I was on the Richard Rogers Commission. We awarded that show I some money about three years it. ago. So I like to feel, you know, I said, I think every show submitted this year is terrible except one called Rent. And I thought they were going to yell at me. And they said, you know, you're right. So, so on this whole Tony so controversy, where do you come down? What the, what the controversy the Tony being? Controversy. Yeah, but what do you see the controversy as? Number one, sticking it to the old school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think. No, I see it as no, no. That's not okay. what I say. That's not uh, the way I would phrase it. All right. I would phrase it as some people felt like that some plays that were good should have been included. Mm -hmm. Not a criticism of what was included, but somehow felt like that there were some plays that deserved consideration. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the two obvious ones were the musical category. Right. It is very big hard. And big and, big and, and, uh, and Victor Victoria. I have enormous respect for people who are trying to write a new original musical comedy. And uh, I, I have trouble with nominating shows that are a collection of songs that were written many, many years ago by a dead, dead person and then saying this is somehow more valid work. Um, I, yeah, I would have respected the committee more if they hadn't nominated Julie Andrews, too, if you know what I mean. It's like they wanted to insult certain people but have their big TV star on at the same time. And I, I totally understand why she turned it down. I think they put her in that position. 
again, she doesn't do that show alone. I, I, you can't just say she's the only good thing about a show. And she understands that. I, I would not have accepted a nomination for a master class if no one else had, you know, and Audra McDonald and Zoe were both nominated. I was very angry that Leonard Folia was overlooked. I think his work was outstanding. Uh, but, you know, yeah. that's the breaks. But it, I think there was a real story in not nominating Have you big seen, and Victor Victoria. Bring Denoid, bring in the fun? Going tonight. I'm very excited. Oh, I, I hear it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I know I'm going to like it. So I'm, This kid is, is him in oh, I've, is, I've seen him since Tap Dance. Kid, 12, he, 12. he was really was 12 then, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, yeah I've seen started him. 12. And then he was in uh, Jelly's Last it's Jam. Great to see you. Next time I want to talk about playwriting, the thing that you tried to teach. Yeah. And just the whole notion of the art of playwriting and how it's different. Thank you. It can be done. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> if you have a good student. If you have a good Terrence good McNally, we thank you for joining us this evening. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. See you then.